Hello, I'm Tom McCabe, President for the Society for American Soccer History. Uh, welcome to our SAS session for the month of May. Two of our members uh, will help us commemorate the 100th anniversary of the American Soccer League. Uh, the first year of play was the 1921-22 season. Uh, our society works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. I was recently reminded of that uh, and of Sash's mission when writing about Sam Folds. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Sam was one of the founding members of Sash back in 1993. And Sam always said, and I quote, uh, we've been here a long time. And then American soccer heritage is something that we can proudly display to the world without any apologies, end quote. So without apology, I'll once again uh, ask those uh, who are now or will see this later, uh, please renew or join uh, our membership. You can do that through the Join Sash uh, tab on our website at ussoccerhistory.org. Uh, one of the member benefits is our quarterly newsletter, so ably put together by Brian Bunk, where we have current news uh, about members, projects, uh, and the like. You can best find us at that website and, of course, on social media uh, with our Twitter and Facebook pages. Also on the website, check out our upcoming events. Our next session will be June 3rd with uh, journalist Michael Lewis. Uh, he's going to join us to discuss his new book on the Rochester Lancers, a team that played its first couple of years of existence in the American Soccer League, uh, today's topic before joining the North American Soccer League in 1970. Today's focus is the first iteration of the American Soccer League, professional league formed in 1921. Regrettably, the official records of the ASL no longer exist, or they didn't survive uh, an archival travesty that both Roger Alloway and Colin Jose lamented in their seminal work on the league. Uh, they as co-authors sided with uh, what Sam Folds felt happened to those records. They were tossed into the dustbin of history, perhaps even um, uh, you know, into the dustbin uh, when they moved uh, from uh, the headquarters at the Cornish Arms in New York City uh, to the Empire State Building after World War II. Uh, the USSF uh, bin those uh, unfortunately. But thankfully, we have Dan Creel and Gabe Logan uh, to bring the ASL uh, to life, at least to bring uh, some of those stories back to life. And we're going to start with Dan, whose research includes the ASL, men's and women's U.S. Open Cups. He writes and podcasts for protagonist soccer and has built uh, the Soccer Almanac, uh, a website that hopes to become a reliable uh, record of U.S. clubs, leagues, and organizations. He lives in the suburbs of D.C., Maryland, uh, and uh, his earliest soccer memory was being taken to a match as a child somewhere around Swindon, England. So uh, over uh, to Dan, and then from there, we'll move uh, to Gabe Logan. Dan. Thank you. Let me see if I can share this. Is everybody seeing that? Okay, yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. So yeah, I wanted to put together this um, short summary of the fall river season of 1921-22 because it touches on the founding and very first season of the ASL and a major transition that soccer went through in Fall River over that very brief period of time. I'm also hoping that it might clarify some possible confusion concerning that situation that year. And finally, I just think it's interesting that some of the underlying issues going on at that time are honestly still around 100 years later in US soccer. So quick background of, of the Fall River Rovers. I cribbed this from the uh, Spalding's Guide, volume 1917-1918, that covers the, the previous season of 1916-1917. So the Rovers were organized in February 1884. They're one of the original 13 AFA teams of 1884. They won the FA Cup in 88 and 89 as the first New England team to do so. Um, I'm going to skip down because uh, we have a little bit more time. I'm going to go into this a little bit more than I thought. So they were, 
I would call them the presumed winners of the 1909-1910 Eastern Association Football League. This is a really interesting league that was around just for that one season. It was kind of a super league, um, and a kind of a proto-American soccer league at that time. And there were six teams, two each from, from New England, Fall River Rovers and Howard and Bullock from Pawtucket, two from, Pencil, two from Philadelphia, Hibernians and Thistles, and two from the New Jersey-based National Association Football League, uh, West Hudson and Newark. And the, the two New England teams, this became their primary league for the season as the New England League that they were um, taking part in disappeared. But the two pencil to the two Philadelphia and two uh, New Jersey teams played in this league at the same time they were playing in their regular league. So it was kind of a, a, a semi Champions League type situation. What happened is by the end of the season in the spring, the schedule wasn't completed, which was fairly common at that time, but Fall River had done enough to be considered the winners. Nobody was going to cast them up, and the league kind of went quiet, and Fall River was anxious to be considered the league champions, and so in the summer, they actually traveled down to, the, to Newark to the EAFL official offices to ask them to officially call them the winners of this league, and also because they wanted some, they were promised gold medals. The winners of the league would get gold team team would get gold medals. I'm not sure if that ever happened. If there was an official announcement, I couldn't find. So that's why I consider them the presumed winners of this league. It's really interesting league. Uh, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff there and, and there's, there's definitely more research to be done in the EAFL. Um, so, so back to the Rovers uh, near the beginning of the USFA. Uh, is it, uh, is it, uh, was sanctioned by FIFA. The Rovers were suspended by the USFA in January of 1914 because they played the then outlaw teams of the St. Louis Soccer League. Uh, Rovers were finally reinstated in August of that year, and they were supposed to play in the inaugural season of the Southern New England League, the 1914-1915 season. Um, but they withdrew just as the season started, the Rovers did, because several teams in that league were playing for less than 25 cents admission. And the Rovers thought that was something that was not done. They were not going to play in the league where the ticket prices were so low. So they basically dropped out of the league that season. They did rejoin the next season, 1915, 1916, and they were members of that league through 1921-22. They won the league title in 1919-20. Um, they lost the National Challenge Cup final to Bethlehem Steel in 1916, but they won the rematch in 1917. Uh, they also won the Times Cup that year. The Times Cup was the Southern New England Football Association's cup for those teams. So it was probably their best season was that 1916-1917 season, even though they didn't win the league that, that year. So kit colors, traditional kit colors for most of their history were blue and gold. Blue and old gold was often, often what was given. But for a really short period of time in the early 1910s, they sported garnet, the big white R on their jerseys. So important names, important of officials of the, of the team, Lawrence Holden, Harold Crook, and Randolph Howarth, who was the manager of the club. So quickly, before I get into the, the athletic grounds, as this, as this slide shows, I just wanna show a couple pictures out of place for pictures here. So on the left is the Rovers for their, for their uh, National Challenge Cup championship team. That's again from the, the Spalding's guide there with the cup on the right is the St. Michael's Club of Fall River. So at the time of the founding of the ASL, the end of the Southern New England League, this was the Fall River's main, main rival in, in Fall, Fall River. Um, and so their colors are red. So those, those are red, red jerseys they have on there with the S and the M on there. So the Fall River Athletic Grounds uh, was the main um, athletic field in Fall River at this time. It was in use from 1893 through 1922. It was located on Bedford Street at Oak Grove Avenue and Beatty Street. It was used for minor league baseball until 1915. Um, so the Fall River Rovers was the top club in the city during the 1910s. Uh, 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 another club that was, was had that was bigger a little bit before that in Fall River was, was called the Pan American Club. That club disbanded in 1917, kind of leaving the Rovers as, as the big team in, in Fall River. But that Pan American Club was reorganized by C.C. Con Murphy Jr. starting in 1915 and 1916, and both teams, both Fall River teams, then joined the Southern New England League for that 1915-1916 season. 
So what's important here for the situation that was going on right when the ASL was, was, was founded was that the Rovers was the quote unquote big Fall River Club. And as the big Fall River Club, the Rovers would assume every year complete control of the athletic grounds for the soccer season from early fall through early summer. So what would happen, practically what would happen, other Fall River soccer clubs would then have to come to the Rovers and pay the Rovers to play at the athletic grounds for their home games. So the Rovers basically controlled the, the big soccer grounds in Fall River. That was the grounds that had a big grandstand. Um, quickly, the Pan Americans, uh, the reorganized Pan Americans disbanded in early 1919. And what they did is they disposed of their interests um, many of their players and other assets to this new St. Michael's Club, which was managed by Manuel Frazee Almeida. That kind of those interests included the second Fall River franchise in the Southern New England League. So St. Michael's joined the Southern New England League for that 1919 1920 season, uh, of which Rovers was part of. During the summer of 1920, discussions took place to create a regional Eastern Soccer League, primarily with teams from the Southern New England League and the National Association Football League. The teams interested from the Southern New England League were the Fall River Rovers, Four River from Quincy, Massachusetts, and J&P Coates Club from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Now, one issue that was always under there was these long travel that was required, especially for the New England teams. And because of this long, long travel, um, and also the relatively poor gate attendance compared to New England at the New Jersey and Pennsylvania um, teams' home fields, the Rovers wanted a guarantee of roughly $100 given by the home team to ease the burden of traveling clubs. There's a lot of negotiations back and forth about, about those type of issues, practical issues of, of you know, how much the clubs would take care of each other, how much would they would be on their own during that summer. At a meeting of the Southern New England Football Association in early August, Fall River was leaning towards joining the Eastern League, but what they did is they passed to the two other interested clubs before they kind of presented their decision. What happened is both JMP Coates and Four River, Four River declared they would not join the proposed league, and then the Rovers said, okay, so we're not going to join them either. Neither, none of us in the New England League, league is going to join, so that basically scuttled this, this first try to the Eastern, Eastern League. Um, Thomas Cahill, uh, well-known name in, in soccer, uh, U.S. soccer, is currently at this point in time the executive secretary of the USFA. He continued to work on trying to form this new Eastern League during the 1920-1921 season. Um, so Cahill met with organizers of this club that was going to become Fall River United in late 1920 and early 1921 to discuss bringing the National Challenge Cup final and to Fall River and to hand his proposed National Soccer League also to that city. Led by Dr. Arthur J. Sullivan, Fall River United Athletic Association was formally organized in early 1921 following those meetings with Cahill. The main objective of the organization was to secure the athletic grounds for the purpose of staging athletic events there. Two major Fall River Rover players, Connie Lynch and Freddie Parker, joined the United organization while still continuing to play for the Rovers during the 1920-1921 Southern New England League season. So during the uh, early part of, of 1921, Cahill was in talks with both the Rovers and the United about joining his new league. What ended up happening is Fall River United acquired the lease on athletic grounds instead of the Rovers for the first time in, in, in quite a while, and then was also given the franchise in Fall River in the American Soccer League. When, according to Cahill, the Rovers declined in large part because they didn't wanna take on the financial obligations related to, to kind of moving up to a bigger uh, major league. So on July 21st, Fall River United tied third Lenark AC of Glasgow two to two before 2000 athletic grounds in Fall River. Goals for Fall River United were by Harry Radican and Freddie Parker. Basically, that roster for that friendly uh, on that date was the roster that, that Fall River United would end up having for the ASL season, except the one primary um, difference was, was Harry Radican, who was, a, who was a free agent at that time. He didn't 
uh, sign on to Fall River United. I think he, I think he, um, at the beginning of the ASL season, he was with Harrison and eventually moved to Todd Shipyards. Um, on August 29th, the Southern New England Football Association refused to grant permission to Fall River United and JMP coach to enter the quote National League of Soccer Football. So they were not happy. They, they thought the ASL and the USFA was encroaching in their territory and, and they got to decide if, if, if kind of what would happen if their teams could move to this league. And so they refused to grant permission to those two teams to do so. The two teams were undeterred. They, they went ahead, obviously, and joined the league. On September 17th, Fall River United lost its first American Soccer League match 3-2 to two to Falco FC of Holyoke at the Fall River Athletic Grounds before 600 in miserable weather. The first two home matches for Fall, Fall, Fall River United, the, the attendance was fairly low, about that level, because the weather was so bad. After that, the attendance grew to, to a, a couple thousand uh, on um, home games for them. So this season, the Southern New England League was down to four teams. That included the Fall River Rovers and St. Michael. Um, on October 2nd, after the ASL had begun play with their two New England teams, the Southern New England FA passed a resolution protesting the action of the National Commission of the USFA and allowing the ASL to operate in their district against the ruling of the local association. Nothing happened. They passed a resolution. Nobody in the ASL or the USFA cared. The ASL continued, Fall River United and JMP Coates continued playing. So it's basically a toothless, ended up being a, a toothless move by the Southern New England Football Association. Um, the kind of old rivals of the Fall River teams, JMP Coates in the National Challenge Cup kind of did a, a Fall River treble. <laughs> they knocked out the Rovers in the first round. In the second round, Coates knocked out St. Michael's, and in the third round, they knocked out United. So they just kind of swept through their, their Fall River brethren in the National Challenge Cup. Fall River United actually started off pretty well. They started 2 one and one but then basically struggled badly as the season continued. The Rovers played well in the Southern New England League, as they had. They were one of the top teams in the league, but the league itself struggled. It was basically fall, starting to fall apart. They were uh, finding it hard to schedule and play teams. Play their play their games. Um, Rovers had two actually good friendlies uh, during December. They beat JMP Coates two to nothing in an exhibition on December tenth, and they beat Fall River United two to one in an exhibition on December twenty sixth. Both of the athletic grounds. This was so Rovers could fill open dates on their schedule, which they're having trouble filling because of league league issues. So you can see it is kind of interesting to see that even though United and Coates who were part of the big major. American Soccer League, and it was a, a jump up in kind of many financial ways. Th there was not much difference at this point um, during the teams like, like the Rovers and United and the Coats. They, they were basically competitive. Um, so just before the first match of the Southern New England League season, the St. Michael's team refused to play the October 1st game against the Rovers at Lafayette Park, which was an open public park in Fall River. Um, the Rovers sent an open letter to local newspapers charging that they were unable to make arrangements to play home games at the athletic grounds. Fall River United then responded with their own open letter discussing that situation. Rovers claimed they were unable to make arrangements for the, to use the grounds with United, who obviously owned the lease at that point. United claimed that the Rovers had been instructed to arrange matters with St. Michael for games when United, when United was playing away. And that's because St. Michael... <laughs> had already made their own agreement with the United and they were just waiting for United to come to St. Michael to kind of figure out a time when the Rovers could play. So it's a, it's a very complicated match. You see a lot of the power struggle that's just going on there. Uh, in a follow-up letter to, to newspapers, um, Fall Review United claimed that the Rovers had charged other teams 25% of gate receipts and they had basically decided to charge the same to, to the Rovers and St. Michael's. The Rovers responded to that saying, well, 20, we've never done 25%. 25% is kind of a super high rate. We don't, we don't know what the United is talking about. Then in, in kind of early October, the Rovers sent this really long letter to the Fall River Globe about why they're not in the American Soccer League, how that all happened and the controversy around athletic grounds. Um, there's a lot of information there about 
kind of negotiations and, and contracts and numbers and things like that. Um, but basically what they said is, is that they had, Fall River Rivers had gone to United and said, we're willing to play if we just pay you a lump sum. Like we'll pay you a lump sum instead of a, a per game percentage. And United said, no, we're not going to do that. And it turns out that that's what St. Michael's had done. They found that St. Michael's had paid a lump sum to United and Rovers was kind of aggrieved that they were the, had bumped, been bumped down the, the priority in, in Fall River. But a week later in mid-November, uh, the Rovers and United came to an agreement for the Rovers to use the athletic grounds for the remainder of the season. So for the 1921-22 season, Fall River, United, Fall River United ended season in the ASL next to last, well off the pace. They only came ahead of uh, Falco of Holyoke. Um, both those teams were really at the bottom compared to the top five teams. There was a really break, break there between the uh, kind of the, 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 the top of the league and the bottom two teams. The Southern New England League practically fell apart after St. Michael's withdrew in mid-November. That left them with three clubs, and those three clubs looked like, a, you know, it's hard to find information at this point as the league started to fall apart, but those three clubs played probably a handful of league games in the spring. The schedule for that season was definitely not completed, as which I've said, which was actually fairly common for leagues during that time, but they usually, leagues would usually figure out a way to, to, to have a champion, a formal champion for that season, but I wasn't, I wasn't able to find that in the newspapers if the Southern New England League had an official champion that 1921-22 season. Um, in early April, the Rovers challenged United to a best two out of three series for the championship of Fall River. So, you know, in the early, early 1900s, it was tradition, it was regular for teams to get together and fight the top teams to fight for a city championship outside of league and, and cup structures. And so um, the Rovers was doing that here. After some negotiations, the clubs were agreed to terms. After a, after a deduction of the war tax from the gross receipts of each game, 16 and a quarter percent was deducted from that, uh, was then deducted with 10% going to Fall River United for grounds rent and six and a quarter to the Salvation Army as a gift from both clubs. And the net receipts were then split evenly after that. Um, after splitting the first two games on April 29th and May 6th, United won the final match three to two on May 13th, 13th to win the city championship. And that was basically, that was the end to both team seasons. At the same time, the Rovers in April were, and United were negotiating their city championship. It was revealed that the athletic grounds were to be sold by Roy H. Beatty to David H. Pomfret and two others who wanted to use the land to build homes and sell the rest for house lots. Dr. A.J. Sullivan of Fall River United held a lease on the athletic grounds, as I talked about before, and that lasted until May 15th when the sale was due to be finalized. So a huge, a huge wrinkle in this was that uh, a small plot of land at the corner of Oak Grove Avenue and Bedford Street on which the grandstand was located was separately deeded to a Mr. Geegan, who was the former caretaker of the grounds. Sullivan, while the, he held a year lease that was gonna end on May 15th on most of the field, he held a long lease on this smaller particular plot that included the grandstand and the sale of the remainder of the property to Pomfret did not include the corner lot owned by Geegan. Pomfret was willing to negotiate a one-year lease, but that the Rovers and United would need to do so jointly. The parties weren't able to find a deal. Negotiations went on and on and on during the summer. So Fall River United put a deposit on another piece of land somewhere in the city. Oops, sorry. So Thomas Cahill traveled to Fall River during June 1922 to discuss the Fall River situation. He really wanted to keep a Fall River team in the American Soccer League, and he wanted to figure out a way to do that. During these meetings, the officers of the Rovers and United agreed to a merger. This merged organization was going to renew negotiations on the lease with Pomfret for athletic grounds, and it would also field two teams one in the American Soccer League and the another in the Southern New England League and other local leagues. Cahill returned the next month in July and he found the situation basically still the same. The, the, the organizations had merged, the negotiations with Pomfret had gone basically nowhere, at standstill, nothing was going on. 
So the ASL quickly gave the option on a Fall River franchise to Sam Mark. Mark obtained land in Tiverton, Rhode Island, and quickly built a new stadium there for a soccer team, which played his first match preseason friendly on September 24th against Salesville, Rhode Island. Only two weeks before that match, uh, the application of the finally merged Fall River United Rovers FC for a franchise in the ASL was unanimously object rejected by the league. And at that same meeting, an application for a new Philadelphia franchise was approved at that same meeting, which brought the league to seven teams, which was the number that started the 22-23 season. Connie Lynch, former player manager of the defunct United, became coach and captain of Baltimore FC, bringing with him members of United and St. Michael's teams, along with others. Due to lack of interest now, the Southern New England League went inactive for the 2022, 1922-1923 uh, season. And finally, in the wake of a turbulent season and after 38 years in existence, the Fall River Rovers disbanded that fall as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Dan, and, and we're going to give the opportunity for Gabe to, to load his slides. Um, I, I think we'll save questions, uh, you know, for, for the, the end there, but, uh, you know, one of those soccer hotbeds, uh, Fall River, and uh, I love uh, the contested ground that, that was there in, in the early 1920s. Perhaps we can have a discussion of that. Uh, but we're going to move a, a few years forward to 1924-25 and uh, the National Challenge Cup, otherwise known as the U.S. Open Cup. So uh, Gabe uh, Logan is a professor of history at Northern Michigan University. His research uh, primarily focuses on the game's early decades with an emphasis in the Midwest, Chicago, St. Louis, and Detroit. Um, so uh, he's, he's moving away from those early decades to kind of get into this uh, really important decade of the 1920s. So uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Gabe Logan. Yep. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so I'm going to use the names National Challenge Cup and Open Cup interchangeably. And I trust that my Connection remains somewhat stable, but these are the two teams that played in that, the Shawsheen Massachusetts Indians and the Chicago Canadian Club. Um, when, I when I began to look at this again, I first examined it about 10 years ago, and I was struck by the amount of research that has taken place on this match in the, in the past decade. And when I was lamenting at this to one of my colleagues, uh, they pointed out there's two types of research outcomes, knowledge that expands the existing body of scholarship and that knowledge that is new to the discoverer. Uh, when I started looking at this tournament, and as I say, I was taken back by the research, this certainly places me in the research new to the discoverer camp. Uh, so if you're interested in more of this match than I can do it justice in the next 10 minutes, here are some of the people that have written up on this match a lot more extensively. With this in mind, I will provide an overview of the existing knowledge of the tilt and expand our scholarship by further exploring the teams, some of the players, along with the significance of the championship match. In terms of background, and as Dan pointed out, the National Challenge Open Cup Championship began in 1913-14 when Brooklyn Field Club offended Brooklyn Celtic. For the next 19 teams, Bethlehem, Field Club, uh, Bethlehem Steel won five of the next six championships as the Open Cup developed into a respectable tournament. During the 1920s, the Cup evolved again. The St. Louis Professional Soccer League entered their city teams into the competition, which usually saw a Mound City 11 emerge as the Western champion over their regional competitors in Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. Conversely, the Eastern champion was usually a member of the American Soccer League, that region's professional circuit. These Open Cup matches saw spirited play, talented kickers, well-organized teams, and large crowds, and enthusiastic crowds in the tens and thousands. 
Unfortunately, uh, Gabe is going in and out here. Um, so, sorry to hear that, uh, Gabe, you might have to log out and log back on. You're in and out. Is everybody else getting this as well? All right, sorry about that, folks. Uh, why don't we um, go to some questions uh, for, for Dan Creel, uh, if uh, anybody, uh, we, Gabe, are you back? I am back, sorry okay. about that. All right. You know, I started yeah, to grab a beer and I thought, wow, that wouldn't be professional. And then this happens. I'm like, well, why didn't I grab a beer? <laughs> right, right, right. Well, why don't you pick up uh, you, you, with the, the, the factory and ethnic clubs, uh, yeah. you know, out in the Western. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will. <laughs> uh, so anyway, these ethnic teams, they relied on the community support for uh, the facilities or to pay the neighborhood park fees and the ethnic fan base uh, provide the players a salary. So that said, <clears throat> by February 7th, 1925, the 32 entries were whittled down to 16 and then eight by March. In early April, 1925, the final four were set. Uh, in the Eastern bracket, Abbott Warstead and Shawshank Indians played at the latter's home grounds while the Cleveland Thistles took on Chicago's Canadian club at Chicago's DePaul's University Field. These two matches, again, emphasize tech. Happened again. Uh, looks like we've got to, to the semifinals and, and the final is coming up. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he's gonna log back in, uh, but why don't we go uh, to some questions uh, for, for Dan. Um, the, the one I have, and, and unfortunately, society member Derek Gonzalez uh, is not on the call, uh, but I found the St. Michael's really interesting because um, that's the Portuguese communities right. club. And then you mentioned Almeida as, uh, you know, the manager, I'm assuming, uh, a natal of, of San Miguel, you know, one of the, the, the Portuguese islands uh, in the Azores that, that migrated so extensively. Um, could there have been an ethnic element going on with this contested ground between United and Rovers and, and uh, uh, St. Uh, St. Michael's? Yeah, I mean, definitely. It, it, there, it wasn't, <clears throat> there was nothing apparent in the newspaper articles that was going on. There's a, there's nothing apparent in the newspaper articles that a power struggle was going on. There's no, I think these days they would have, uh, reporters would have talked about some type of power struggle that that United was picking sides to try to get rid of Rovers. I don't think Cahill had the great. Well, K had had contentious relationships all over the place. Um, it, it felt like Cahill didn't have a great relationship with the Rovers, and they were he, he was trying to like make the situation better to, for his sake in, in Fall River. So I think he was working with United to get a uh, to get a franchise there. And he was kind of, I don't think he was giving lip service to Rovers. I think it was more than that. Um, but I think St. Michael's was a, was a piece in that power struggle. And um, just from that, that standpoint, right? They, United worked with Mike, St. Michael's to get an agreement and then Rovers was on the outs. Um, I definitely think there was an ethnic issue there, right? An ethnic, um, yeah, uh, you know, it was a Rovers, right? And, and St. Michael's was just Portuguese. Um, it's just not there. That it's just not there in the in the articles. Kind of that situation. It wasn't. It's not plain as it is sometime in other parts of history. You'll see. When I was doing St. Louis, there's a lot of a lot more of that that I saw. It might have just been a different or earlier time period. Um, but that's the St. Michael situation was, was, you know, I don't want to take up too much time. It was really incredible with, with Almeida. He actually got injured, uh, the early of the season before, like badly broke his leg in a game and the, the team basically fell apart without him. It's, it's sad. Later that year, he, his family almost, um, died of carbon monoxide asphyxiation. They had to come and, and, and take his whole family to the hospital. Um, and the team kind of suffered without his leadership 
Um, and I think at this the, the point where they withdrew from the they came back to the league and they had to withdraw again because he still wasn't 100%. He still wasn't leading them. It took a while, I think, for him to come back um, because that team, that club continued on for decades after the St. Michael's team. They returned. I don't know if it was a reorganized team or the same team, but a St. Michael's team re returned to the that a that that ASL time period where they split into to metropolitan and New England. A St. Michael's team returned in the 1950s for a short period of time. So, um, and then there's Ponta Delgada, right, which is right. the the capital of the Azores, and, and that was a really prominent club in, in Fall River. There. Like still have a building that that when I've been up there, it, it, it's their old, I guess, headquarters. Right. Yeah. Right. I think the the um. Yeah, now I'm I'm just off the top of my head. Isn't the West, Western Mass Pioneers in, in in Fall River? Is that right? Um, I think they're based on a, a Portuguese club. Maybe they're not. Um. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Gabe, do you do we want to go back to you to, to no, give it one? I'm disgusted at this point, Tom. Uh, okay. However, I will point out what I found from my research that I think adds to the story is that this is the high water mark of the textile mills. And after 1925, there's a significant exodus out of Massachusetts, uh, mainly to the south, or these, these mills close up. And what I found fairly significant is that a lot of these players out of Massachusetts uh, transfer their skills from the textile mills to the tire companies in Ohio, to the boat works in Detroit, and to machine shops in Chicago. And it's becoming increasingly relevant that in the late 1920s, it's hard once hard pressed to find a professional team in the Midwest that doesn't have a sprinkling of these old Massachusetts players. JMP coats aside, this is the decline of the textile mills after Shawsheen. I found that to be kind of an interesting path for uh, future historians to potentially consider. Uh, 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 me among them, um, because the AFA is last year is 1924. So if you're seeing this kind of high water mark, and then the you know the the AFA you know no longer exists uh, you know right at this same period of time and and clearly the the textile you know towns you know were major major players uh, in in the AFA both on the organizational end the playing end uh, so I've made a note of that I'll have to I'll have to circle back as I, I get closer to the end and and maybe sound you out uh, on that. Other questions for, for anybody on the panel? David. Yeah, thank, thank you both, uh, Dan and Gabe. And despite the technical difficulties, which I think my post Cinco de Mayo brain kind of enjoyed in some perverse way, um, I, I still got a lot out of that. Um, and, and I'm really, really, really interested in, in uh, a common theme I'm seeing between the two of them in terms of power relations and shifting hegemonies and um, you know, this is kind of, you know, tagging along to, to, um, to Tom's question, but I'm, I'm wondering to what degree, um, it, it's interesting looking at the one, uh, as a microcosm and the other, a macrocosm maybe of, um, the negotiatings of these power bases and, and Dan, I was really curious about, um, the negotiations over percentages of gates. Uh, the 6.25 to the Salvation of Army, which is, of course, a Protestant organization, right? So if maybe there was something with the United and Rovers as opposed to the St. Michael's, again, I'm just trying to think through these different power relations, and especially, Gabe, this really kind of, the thing that really came out to me in some ways is uh, trying to think through notions of the ASL 1.0, if you will, um, and the resistance to um, marketing along ethnic lines, as opposed to more geographic. I thought what was really fabulous in, in yours is that the way you broke that down by East and West, um, in terms of corporate sponsored or maybe workers sponsored, which sometimes like in the case of say RB Leipzig or, uh, Bayer Leverkusen can be difficult to sort through. Um, 
but also, you know, the idea of the, these entities and what they represented, who they represented. Um, and so I guess I want to try that, tie that together to a question to either one of you with the one question that I keep struggling with so bad in the New York um, resources. And clearly my myopia is really affecting me now as these other databases, I think are opening so much up, right? The, the, the shifting, say if, you know, a fall route, Fall River Rovers fan. Um, how many became United fans? How many would have resisted that? How many, you know, how many would have become Marksman fans? And and Gabe, I'm I'm wondering also along those lines in terms of um, the different variety of clubs there. How difficult was it to negotiate such a competition when um, the investment of capital and the rewarding of labor may be so very complicated in very different axes? Dan, I'll pass the torch to you to let you begin with that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> so another level that was going on at the same time in Fall River and obviously other cities, but Fall River also had a more local, you know, Fall River League going on with Fall River teams. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't even part of of kind of my survey of of this kind of higher level kind of ASL Southern New England League situation. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there's a lot there, especially like there is a lot there for, for academic, academic work that's available to see what type of communities were going on. It, it, it's, it's honestly hard to know from the newspapers and obviously the newspapers have a bias. Newspapers are coming from a specific, specific position. And I wasn't seeing, like I just said before, I wasn't seeing a lot of, oh, all the Fall River Portuguese fans, St. Michael's is their team, right? And all the, all the, the Protestant fans go to, to Rovers and United is, is doing this. Um, my guess my guess is that um, Fall River United was seen as the, not quite, eh, eh, the major major league team at that level uh, from the ASL. Um, I think they had that cachet uh, and they had the athletic grounds. Um, they were in the big, bigger league. So I, I'm not sure, I would think, Again, this is a guess. I would think they're giving getting a cross section. I don't know if it was based on a specific ethnic group or, or type of player. Sorry to interrupt you there, but I just yeah. what I found so incredibly fascinating was uh, the turf wars that were being played out there, and oh, the yeah. way in which they may have been represented in the in the local media. But you know, if the Rovers keep their lease, then the major league status is worthless, right? Um, so for for United to suddenly get it, hegemony shifts radically to them. Yes. Yeah. So how is that secured? What kind of political allegiances were there? Again, I'm thinking like in the context of, um, you know, certainly in the, the 1890s, the, uh, the identification with the Giants, and again, their one month dalliance with, the, with professional soccer there, its relationship to Tammany Hall and the Democratic Party, again, like to what degree maybe political influence? Again, I'm also thinking of, Sir Henry Norris and, and Arsenal, and the securing of, of you know the move from South London to North London for the Arsenal. Um, if there's those kinds of power relations, we can kind of tease out in terms of how you secure access to to, to play at a particular ground that has the the infrastructure to allow for a fan a fan base. Yeah, and, and what we see what we see is Fall River FC with the marksman. Is it basically? It all goes out to Tiverton. Like athletic grounds bounces around. Uh, some of the local soccer st is still played at athletic grounds during the summer, but they don't really need a grandstand. So the actual practical situation of what the new owners had to do with the grandstand, they keep saying, "Oh, we're going to tear it down and sell the lumber." You got to you got to negotiate as quickly. We're going to do this, but they had an issue of they had to deal with the second owner. Um, so a few smaller you know, uh, like boxing, boxing would go on in the athletic grounds too, it's boxing a, a few soccer grounds, but it, it, that situation, the athletic grounds were, were done by that year. And then the entire, you know, all that kind of top level interest went out to Tiverton and Fall River and you started getting, you know, 10,000, 15,000, the, 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 the year Gay was, was, was focusing on that, um, the ASL cup match, something like 15, the final was like 15, 17,000 at, 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 Mark Stadium at Tiverton. So it really was a, 
I don't know enough about the internal situation at Fall River to speak to what you're talking about, David, but there's, there's, a t there's obviously tons there. But it, it, it does feel like, again, it does feel the situation hasn't changed that much where the big team comes in, you get a big shiny stadium, selling some alcohol is available. That's why it's in Tiverton. That's why it's across the Massachusetts line so he could play on Sundays and sell alcohol that stadium filled up. And, and that's, that's, you know, they got, a, they did get a cross section for the marksmen. Uh, I think lower down and, and the political kind of power struggles it's there. It's just hard. To, uh, I was just a survey. I couldn't, I couldn't, I wasn't getting that deep down to give you any type of expert answer to what was actually going on. Mm. Dave, you asked an interesting question from the Shawshank Canadian match. And I, I kept going back to this high water mark of the textile mills. And Shawshin had a had a real opportunity here after they won that. They entered the ASL and they did really well in the 1925-26 season. And then the owner uh, would ends up committing suicide. And the heirs liquidate the the mill and the factory and one of the liquidation aspects of it's the football club. And so when that happens, there's this diaspora of the players, some of them have really fine careers in the ASL. But those others that went to the Midwest that I kind of tracked down to speak to your question, uh, you know, Cleveland has different Ohio. You have Goodyear, you have Firestone, you have the White Automobile Company. They have these strong industrial powerhouses, but they're not allowing any of the Bohemian players to play in Cleveland. So they form the Magars and they're drawing better crowds. Uh, they're getting better players. And then we see that happening in Chicago. How does the bricklayers, which has a very finite fan base of Scots, compete with Sparta and the Bohemian community in Chicago? Matter of fact, the Canadian club ran into that problem. Uh, when they went back to Chicago, Chicago and St. Louis launched a 1928 professional circuit, one of many, and the Canadian club couldn't get the money to bring in players. And so they aligned, they took a page from the bricklayers and aligned with the Chicago Carpenter Union to buy these new players because a Canadian ethnic club wasn't gonna cut it in Chicago. Yeah. Great stuff, thank you. Other questions out there? I have another one, but it gladly yield to someone else. I'll go. This is like, a, I think this is a question for the group. When Dan was talking about travel expenses, I know this is something that's very interesting to Ed Farnsworth, um, the, the notion of travel, the distance, how much it costs. Um, I've seen evidence of uh, a whole team from say New Jersey staying in one of the, the taverns, hotels, you know, one of these establishments in Fall River. Um, I, I just opened it up to, to, to the group. It's a fascinating topic on, on how you get a team and maybe even its officials and some of its supporters from one place to the other. I'll, I'll just open it up. How, how did they make that affordable? How did, were, were they able to do that and, and make money or not lose money for, for their club? So real, real quickly, the, the big, big concern, well, the, the, one of the big concerns that was lifted up for the Rovers was when you create this regional league, the travel is, is longer. So if you have a, a smaller way to, go, way to travel, um, bad weather, you, you would learn in the morning, the, the pitches covered at ice don't, don't come over this afternoon. If you're going from Fall River down to New Jersey, you're already on the train. And the worry was, well, we're already leaving. We won't know until we're on the way if you cancel the match that day. And so they have to be like, we're just going to hop on a train and go all the way down, get there, be told it's off and, and go all the way back. So we need assurance. We, we need to have a, our expenses covered. That, that was literally a practical thought that they had about as you expand the size, geographical size of the league, that you have these practical issues of travel come up. That was something that left it up. 
Yeah, Tom, that's an interesting take question from the Midwest as well. This professional league between St. Louis and Chicago, one of the breakdowns was the cost of travel. And I see that in the early uh, leagues that tried to bring these two cities and other Midwest cities together. Uh, even Chicago and Milwaukee in 1904, when Kaminsky tried to put together a professional team, travel was the big, the, what put a stop to it, that and, and not enough fans coming out. Uh, interesting, some of the statistics I found on this Open Cup match, uh, the Canadian club went uh, $1,600 in the hole trying to get out to Sam Marks's field. And there was concern they weren't going to have enough money to even get back. <laughs> Fall, Fall River, they would have those uh, special ferries that would gone out of the games in New York mm -hmm. too, right? Um, but that's not like the British Rail Football Specials, right? I mean, was that public infrastructure or did somebody commission those ferry rides and did somebody affiliated with the club profit from the opportunity? Does anybody know? I, I, don't, I have no idea. I know, well, it, it was the, the Fall River line, right? This, this ferry line. And uh, it, it was kind of a luxury liner, right? It was known for its, its food, its, I think, grandness. Uh, but that was an overnight ferry, right? So you would leave, you know, Fall River and, and sail through the night to, to land in, in uh, you know, a port in, in Manhattan. Uh, so I'm sure they had group rates or, or you know, third class rates that, that they would, would use. You, you also see evidence of, of you know, rail uh, being used. One of my favorite ones, um, one of the Fall River clubs, uh, lost a match, they get knocked out, and uh, they don't have any money, right? So, so they walk overnight, you know, down the railroad tracks uh, to, to, you know, kind of heads down, tired, weary, hungry, you know, coming back into town, you know, after loss. So this, this was a real concern um, it, it, that I think plays out in, in all these locales, and, and it was a real hindrance to to knitting a soccer nation together. Good point. Ed. Uh, I was, I was going to say, I, I think one of the things that uh, teams in Pawtucket and Fall River did, like late 1880s, uh, early 1890s, is they, and I think this is to address two things. One is travel expenses, um, and the other is paying for players, is they organized as stock companies. And so you have uh, that kind of investment going on uh, in a kind of a formal way, but then they also uh, would uh, ask for subscriptions, which is kind of the same thing in a way, uh, uh, where local business people would would front money to for for covering travel expenses. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, uh, the Pan American team, which was named because they won the Pan American exposition games you know lots of lots of clubs were ready to to enter that competition until they were told you're not going to get any money and so it's like well never mind that <laughs> but you know some you know a handful of teams from st louis and and canada for whatever reason had some kind of extraordinary financial backing to to get them not just out there but you know, to pay for accommodations and I'm sure, you know, per diems for meals, blah, blah, blah. The travel, the travel aspect really, really is fascinating. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a real barrier to participation of the, the, like, for example, the, the Bari team of Ver Vermont enters the AFA in like 1890, 91. And they just, they, they can't afford it to travel, to play in Pawtucket or Fall River, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's small towns with big aspirations running up against the wall of financial reality and, and having to pull out. I'm thinking out loud here, you know, with, with this issue of travel and geography and cost, uh, you know, in, in England and in Scotland, you get this rail network, which just booms the game, right? Where it's still a, 
a barrier for some clubs. They couldn't afford it or their supporters couldn't. But, you know, these football specials, you know, it became, you know, big business. Um, and then you look at a place like Brazil. The game gets there a little bit later than in the United States, but massive country uh, where they, they have the state championships, not a national league. You know, it, it, it's, you know, a much more condensed um you know structure uh so yeah i mean it's 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 got me thinking you know and and i know others you know ed and i have had these conversations kurt roush and and it's a good one to have in this kind of public forum because i'm sure it's a, an issue for lots of folks i think you can play that argument out to the nasl with team hawaii and flying out there in the late 70s and you know why did that collapse <laughs> Go from the New York from New York to, to Hawaii to play a game. That's tough. Well, I imagine even, too. You know, you see this sort of thing. Uh, the level of accommodation with, like, for example, MLS teams looking at fellow professional sports and having to travel. You know, economy or maybe business class uh, when you know they're seeing chartered flights for other teams and and uh, I'm you know rail transport. Back in the day, there were different, you know, levels of comfort available. Uh, it's hard. It's hard when you don't have cushy travel arrangements to to be match fit when you get to wherever it is that you're but trying to play. But it can even play. be more complicated than just cost, right? It can be a matter of like who's actually doing the arranging, right? Who's the travel agency that's actually getting you from point A to point B? You know, can for sure. Can, the structure of your competition too do you have to book it through this place and that type of thing it's a really fascinating um important theme running through um american soccer history right if if i've got to get from point a to point b and the referee's got to get from point a to point b and back right who who tells them how to get there what hotel are they staying at you know can you just shop around or, or you know yeah definitely and, and david it's like you know for much of this period it's well is 12 o'clock at your place the same as 12 o'clock at my place when i am I'm, I'm, when i get there at 12 o'clock is is that are we agreed it's 12 o'clock or for me it might be 11 30 you know and then you throw in uh you know before players have saturdays off you know even traveling within a city getting out of work from a factory getting across town for a three 30 kickoff. Hopefully you get it done before it gets dark. You know, well, how are you going to, how are you going to manage that after a work day? You know, it, it's crazy. Some really nuts and bolts kind of stuff that helps to illuminate the uh, challenges that were faced. And like, and as you hinted at, just like, it's remarkable that people pulled some of this stuff off, you know, <laughs> that, that the organization could come together to make some of these things happen. I think a huge chunk of like was uh, it goes to what Gabe was talking about. The reason the ASL in 24, 25, they actually want to do it. I think a couple of years earlier, they didn't see the worth it, it. They made more money playing against themselves than playing lower level teams in the national challenge cup, lower level teams, that's how they made most of their money was these big cup matches. So they wanted to play these cup matches. So it was a struggle and the ASL, you know, pulled out in 24, 25, but regularly doing you know, research on these leagues around that time, what would inevitably happen is you'd have a fall season league season that was pretty well run everything. And then two things would happen. It would be winter and cup season would hit. And then those things would prioritize the league and often leagues, their spring chunk, their spring half would fall apart because they were prioritizing cup games and then bad weather would hit. And so you'd have these weeks, 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 weeks would go by that league games would just disappear off the schedule. The, the ASL two, you know, like early thirties, the new England division was just hampered by that. It's part of the reason why they disappeared is because, and then you've got baseball season coming. So you're trying to squeeze the rest of your season before baseball and inevitably the new England league, would run out of time. They would get stuck not playing the games, the games, and then they just say, "We're done. Like we're done. We can't. We've done our cup matches. We don't have. We don't have the baseball fields anymore. So we're just canceling, canceling the match." And so you see teams struggling with, "How do we afford to do this if we 
you know, the league would be put on hold while the other teams play their cup matches. So the teams in the cup matches would be doing okay, getting money. The other teams were just sitting there waiting, not making any kind of money. And you expect them to then ramp back up a month or weeks later. Yeah, it's very practical issues with, with the American soccer game. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I've, I've got a question that I'd just like to throw out there given the centenary. Um, Tom, you're always talking about complicating the narrative. And uh, I, I, I keep going back to that question that's uh, posed by Colin Joes in, in his ASL book, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the amnesia, um, the neglect for ASL 1.0 and whether or not there's continuity as the ASL goes back on. Gabe, you, my, one of the big takeaways for me from your presentation right now is just, again, kind of recomplicating the role of those ethnic clubs that, you know, I think kind of the dominant narrative now is that ASL 2.0 in the 1930s um, was more ethnically oriented, but, um, you know, as, as I think you demonstrated already today, you know, those, those clubs are thriving and, then, and they're competing. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm curious how Gabe and Dan, how you feel about um, closure of the league or its continuity um, you know, is the ASL of the 30s through um, the 80s, you know, the ASL of my youth and my New York Eagles, my beloved New York Eagles. Um, do you think it's the same league, totally different league? Um, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I'll go ahead and get that. I do think it's a different league. And I now that I'm thinking about this concept of travel, uh, ASL2 allowed for the regional play and allowed for once a year to come together in a national tournament. I'm on the side that it's the same league, but it's gone through a many changes, just like American soccer have. I, I think, <clears throat> I think it's I think it's totally okay if you want to say from from. Uh, I think it's totally okay if you want to say, boy, this chunk of the American Soccer League is so much different than this, this chunk. You just have to look at them differently. But there is a there is a continuity there, and you can't miss the continuity. If you if you decide to say it's different leagues, then you're missing the transition times. And there's multiple transition times. There's your transition from a regular ASL. There's the soccer wars, the big, you know, big daddy soccer wars that happened, which changed it and basically shook up soccer at that time. And it was ASL was a mess right after that. Then there was the transition we always talk about from ASL1 to ASL2, which is a real transition, but there's continuity there. It turns into a different, it, it still, uh, it comes out of the Great Depression and is still considered the major league. It becomes much more professional, maybe not major league professional, it becomes much more professional again. Then you have that, there's a little bit of a renaissance post-World War II, and then the amnesia hit, like real U.S. soccer amnesia hits in the 1950s and 1960s. It is really a super interesting thing that you see when the 66 World Cup happened. And it's almost like, yes, the U.S. Have, US has never played soccer except for some college players uh, and a few ethnic groups and, and some kids. It really is kind of like we've never played. It, it's amazing to kind of see it happen. The ASL weathers that and becomes a regional league. And then when the NASL happens, the ASL remakes itself as a minor league. It becomes a minor league, uh, what, 60, 68, 69. You transition from Ukrainian nationals of Philadelphia, the big team of the late 60s. They, the league, the ASL drops to like four teams. There's like the Syracuse Suns and the, I can't remember who's there. There's a Washington team. Um, and then it, it remakes itself as a minor league American minor league team, but there's a transition there. So I, I personally would say if you're making a break at, you know, soccer wars and you're making a break at um, 33, 34, you should also make a break at right, right around 69, 60, you know, 68, 69, but, but. But then the Bob Cousy years, they weren't content to be a minor league again. Right. I mean, wasn't the whole point of that to try to compete as another major league. 
no yeah 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 that's right that's right um um you know and they like the nasl divorced themselves from the the u.s open cup you know uh, they, there was a transition there where the boston oh was the boston team the, the astros the boston astros did play as an asl team for a year or two in the u.s open cup and um there was a year when when the the, the federation basically said you got to play we're going to kick you out and so they played one year and then the next year they stopped so i guess they they made some type of some type of agreement but yeah that's that's that that's my opinion I, I see it as one organization one league but really there's enough there to say we really got they're really different time periods in this league and we, we need to we need to we need to think of those as that but not forget the transitional times because th those are super important too yeah I think that is a good as a conclusion as we could hope for, right? You know, it's fragmented, fragile, but you know there are connections um, across the American Soccer League timeline. So thanks for everybody uh, for joining. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, we'll, we'll get the recording up. Uh, apologies to to Gabe on uh, our end for 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 the tech, but. Uh, uh, really enjoyed those two presentations. We'll try to, to get James Brown back uh, for his uh, presentation on Arnold Swartz. So uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, have a great weekend. See you on June 3rd uh, with the book talk, uh, Michael Lewis on the Rochester Lancers.